Okay, you're good to go, Joanne. Okay, so how many of you guys um, are familiar with Plural Sight? Do you guys know about Plural Sight? Yeah, I know of it, but I haven't really used it. I heard it's really good though. So the yes, reason I, I wanted also Plural Sight. The reason I wanted to show it to you is because this is how I learned everything that I, um, everything that I am I'm te I'm showing you guys today and everything that I learned, mm -hmm. I learned from Pluralsight. And so that's how I learned how to do all this stuff. And so I thought, well, I'll show you what it is. So like when I wanted to learn how to create a web API, um, I just, um, went on here and there are lots of classes. They actually have a 19 hour learning path on this, but I wanted to show you my favorite guy. And he doesn't know that I'm, he's my favorite guy. Like, I don't even know where <laughs> he lives, but I've never talked to him. I mean, but he is so great. His name is Kevin Doc X, I guess his name is. And he mm -hmm. has all these Netcore web things, and mm -hmm. he's fantastic. And so this, it Plural Sight's expensive. I think it's two ninety nine a year, two hundred ninety nine American dollars a year, or twenty nine dollars a month. But for me, it is well worth it because I can learn anything I need to on here, and it goes into great depth, and it's very tech, very technologically. I think it's very. I just think it's very good. So I just wanted to show it to you. Um, because that's how I learn everything. <laughs> so, um, and that's how I learn everything that, um, to create a web, you know, web API. So, and all of this code I got from that Kevin dude, <laughs> because you can download all of their, um, you can download all of the exercises and so you get all of the code and so you get a lot of great code that way because they have they do everything you know really well so you guys that are on here i don't really need to go over this much because you guys know what this is you know what an api is um and you probably know what a web api is but the basically a web api is just an api that you use http protocol for and the .NET web, .NET web API is just the framework for being able to build these and build web APIs in an easier way. Um, and if you have written a web app before, I think writing a, a web API is a lot easier than writing a web app because you don't have to worry about HTML or presentation. You just have to do the backend code, which I prefer backend code. So I really liked writing a web API. I thought it was really fun and e pretty easy. Not easy, easy, but I mean, much easier for me. I have a harder time with the GUI. So um, basically with the web API, the client has to use HTTP verbs, of course, because he's, he's doing, you're doing that protocol. And the what what .NET does is it maps the HTTP verbs to controller methods and it does that through routing which I'll show you and you commonly return XML or JSON format that's the data the format you return the data in but you can return it in other formats but it makes it um, it's very nice because um, you know you know almost any client can parse xml or json and so uh, it makes your api um, applicable and usable by lots of different um, applications and so they talk a lot about building a restful service which is represent representational state transfer and i was going to show you on here this rest information so a REST, RESTful API is an architectural style, and basically re, uh, an RESTful has these architectural constraints if it's considered to be RESTful. And from what I understand, um, 
you know, you can kind of say you're a RESTful API and not be 100% RESTful. Like, I think that it's used kind of loosely. Um, but if you were going to be, but I think if you're like, if you're a big company, you probably are, they're probably more strict about adhering to these rules. Um, but these are the, the rules. You have to have a uniform interface. Um, there's a different roles between client and server that are, that are specified. It has to be stateless, which of course, that's the whole idea of an API is that everything is stateless. It can be state, it can have state on the client side, but the server is not state, does not maintain state. Every, every call to the API is independent of each, you know, what is independent from each other. And then um, there's, you have to be able to uh, indicate whether you're caching or not. I don't really understand what the layered system is too much. Uh, code on demand says that you can actually return executable code to the client. Um, does anybody, I, I know Daphne and Priyanka, you guys might know, Hunta, I don't know who knows, but um, can you guys explain more about, do you know anything else about RESTful um, design? Because I don't really, I'm not really super clear on it. Do you guys have anything to add? Um, RESTful, as I understand it, is a, a representation of the state. Um, so, for example, if you have in your database, like, um, a class, uh, I'm in class is a bad <laughs> example, but a student, and then the student may have a name, um, you know, an age, the, the major, and so, so on. And then, um, yeah, you would expect that um, when you get a student by the ID, you will get all these properties um, via the API. And when you, for example, do a, a put, you are adding a new student into the database. When you do, do a delete, you're deleting it, deleting that record from the database and so on and so forth. So it should be very close to the way, um, you know, you're, so you're saying structured. So you're saying that it's basically these these concepts that I'm talking about, where you have to, where you ex have the same, I guess, where you have an expectation of what what your expectation is is that you will be able to use get to retrieve data, put to update, post to add, delete to you know to delete, and that it will have an expected outcome. Um, That's right. Yeah. And yeah. so. You, if you so, post, you expect that it's going to add a new record and mm -hmm. it's going to return to you that new record, things like that, which I think a lot of it is taken care of when you do not, .NET Core because it has a lot of things like that, mm -hmm. tools to yeah, help that's you right. that way. So, yeah. so um, this is kind of like a contrast to the old style web services like WCF, where right. you may be interacting with the server, but you're doing maybe a few things in one call. Um, and it's not uh, directly interfacing with, for example, like a, a data um, right. uh, storage. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. So um, let me see if I was going to, these are just some websites. I'm going to, I can upload this if you guys are interested, but um, yeah. What I wanted to do first is just show you this API that I wrote. And I just wanted to talk to you about um, kind of what I did, just so you can see what other people are doing really for, for nothing, no other reason. Um, this, um, I, this is a restaurant point of sale system that I wrote and I, it's based on a NetCore 3.1 API. Um, it has entity framework with a SQL Server database and it resides on a um, Windows Server 2019 virtual machine. And the SQL Server database has menu, order, and employee data, among other things. And I'll show you the database as we go through it. But um, all of this is on a local LAN on a restaurant. In, in, in the restaurant, there's no um, public facing, there's no, no um, outside world. Um, so I didn't have to, uh, uh, communication, so I didn't really have to worry about um, uh, security as much as I would if this was public, but this is on the on a server in the restaurant. And then 
We have five Windows laptops in two different um, buildings. And the laptops serve as cash, have a cash register app on them, which is a WPF application. And I could have made this a .NET Core web app, but I didn't because the old system had a WPF application. So I was able to use a lot of, reuse a lot of the code. And so that's why I left it a WPF application. Plus they're used, it, a lot of their GUI is the same as it was before when I rewrote this. They used to have a WCF application on their server. And so like you were saying, Daphne, what I did was I replaced the WCF and their, and their database with, with NetCore. And the reason that we did that was because their database was very, very poorly designed so poorly designed that they couldn't even, they didn't even keep it from day to day. They had to delete records. It was just a mess. And so when you have a database, it, it really helped me understand when you have a database that's poorly designed at the base of your, of your system, it can really be a problem. And we could have redone some of it, but I mean, the whole design of the database was poor. And so it was better for me to rewrite the database, redesign the database. And then since I did that, I went ahead and, and, and put in um, the NetCore API on top of it. And it's, it's been in production now for a few months. Um, it's stable at this point. We don't consider it to be beta. But what I wanted to show you, so, um, what the what happens in the restaurant is the the wait wait staff goes to the table. Um, they do have takeout also, and they can use this for takeout also. But they have their personal phone, and their personal phone um, has um, uh, I wrote a Xamarin Forms mobile application for their personal phone, and um, if you're not familiar with Xamarin Forms, you write, it's a Microsoft product. It's a tool that you use to write your C-sharp code once, and then it um, compiles it into iOS and Android native apps. So it's very convenient for a C-sharp programmer, and that's why I chose it, because before I did this project, I worked three years um, in, on C-sharp projects, and so I was very familiar with C-sharp. So, that was the easiest thing for me to try. And so I decided to try that. And so uh, it works really well. They just have it in the restaurant. It only works um, on the server. It's not a public um, app. It's only a local app. And so what they do is they take the order on their um, phone with the Xamarin app. And they, when they take the order, it it, um, well, first of all, they get the menu from the API, they send the, um, the order to the API, and then the API sends their order to a Windows printing app, which is actually a NetCore Windows application. It's very small. And I just had to do that because I found out that you can't do Windows printing from a NetCore app. You have to do it from a Windows application. That's just a requirement. And so it prints to two kitchen printers and um, so that they know to make the food. So they take the order and it immediately prints in the kitchen and then they don't have to worry about, um, you know, sending the, sending the order. In fact, sometimes, Rachel, stop it. In fact, sometimes um, by the time they finish the salad and the pizza order, this is a pizza restaurant. As soon as they finish, when they finish, they already have the salad coming out because the kitchen brings it out. I'm gonna kill this dog. Shh, hush. So sorry. So um, anyway, then the the when they're ready to check out, they can go to the cash register and check out and pay and all that kind of stuff. So that's the way that works. And so I wanted to show you, so here is my database, my SQL Server database. And I have orders, customers, employees, menu items, toppings for the pizza and all kinds of different things. And then here's my API. Um, and you know, with the API, the most important thing is the controllers. Everything is really done with the controllers. Come here. Come here. Sorry, I've got to deal with this dog here. So, um, so 
the controllers, really everything is done through the controllers. And so um, what I want to show you is, so I have a versioning system in here where I um, indicate the API version, this attribute, but you don't have to do this. And I'm really not using it, so I'm probably going to delete it. But when I first, um, when I first wrote this, it was just one of the things I learned about. And so what you can do if you have a version is that you can put this version in your, um, in your string, in your route string, and then you can, for example, a client could use a version one or a version two if you had two different versions on your server. And so that can be helpful. Um, I didn't end up using it, but it, it can be helpful. And then this route, route, this means that everything in this controller goes through this route. And this lets the controller know that the types of um, output that I'm producing. And then all of my controllers ha have an API controller attribute and all of them have to derive from controller base. That's just a rule for um, web APIs that they derive from controller base. Um, and then here is my, um, my constructor and my constructor has, I'm bringing in some repositories and this should look familiar to you from when we've um, had dependency injection of repositories uh, before. Um, and then I also have AutoMapper, which um, I'm assuming most of you have used AutoMapper. Have you guys all used AutoMapper? Yes, I have. Yeah, I use. Yes, it's very helpful. <laughs> Um, and then I have the logger in here because I found that with a web API, you really need to do a lot of logging. When I first um, created, when I first released this web API, there were issues with certain things. There were, there were some, um, you know, there were uh, exceptions and all kinds of things happening. And I didn't have good enough logging to know what was going on. And I learned right away that I needed to pretty much log everything that happened <laughs> and, and log as much as possible. So that has really helped me um, to see what's happening in the program. And I can show you that logging if you're interested. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is my first um, uh, method here. And this is an example. What I do is I, in the comment, I try to share what it's going to look like. And so it's going to, the, they would, uh, it would be a, it's satchels.api slash v1 for version one, which I told you I might, I might um, end up uh, eliminating, but, and then it has employees. So roughly, if you'll notice here, I have catering orders, I have a customer, I have discount controller employee. And if you'll notice, it's parallels my um, database. And I think this is pretty standard in the way it works. You know, you have a catering order, you have a catering order controller, you have discount, you have a discount table, you have a discount controller. And basically um, your web API, your, your controllers all correlate to databases, I mean, to the database tables. And those are all, uh, relate to repositories. So like down here, I have, I happen to have all of my data in a data project. I could have had all of this in the same project, but it's, it's a long story as to how it got into separate projects. But these are my entities for my um, entity framework. And as you can see, they're also the same as my controllers, catering order, customer discount, employee. And then my repositories are also the same, the same thing. I have a catering order repository, a customer repository, you know, the same. So it's all, it's all very um, clear as to what is going on. So this controller is going to be doing everything for employees. Um, it's going to be getting employees, adding employees, updating employees, anything that would have to do with employees. So here, as you can see, this is a get employees, and um, I'm going to explain this employee result filter in a little bit. But um, these are my possible status codes that I can get in response. Um, and I'm decorating that because I'm, I'm using um, Swagger, which I'm also going to show you, and that's going to be helpful for that, but I'll show you that in a minute. 
Um, so here, all I do is I don't have, it's not, the, this, the client's not passing me any information. And so I'm just getting my employees and I give a not found error if there's not employees found, although that's probably not gonna happen. And then I'm gonna return an okay status code. Um, so let me show you. So there's lots of different status codes that you can return. And I wanted to show you that. So I have a question. I have a question. Sure. Sorry, John. Uh, sure. John, what does basically this async does? When we do, when we put this async task, the one you have done in the code, what does this async work? Okay, that's a very good question. I didn't know. One of the things I have trouble with with these with these talks is I don't know what people know and what people don't know. <laughs> so I just assumed everybody knows about async, but um, that's good. I'm glad you didn't know because I just figured you did or figured everyone did because it's it's hard to know what people's experiences are. But um, async is um, I, I don't know how it was done before because I came on the scene when async was being used, but as I understand it, before there was async and await, and when I say async and await, you use this async keyword in the method and then you use the await keyword uh, before, an a before you call an asynchronous method. Um, so if when I, it, before this, I understand before async and await, there was a lot of other ways to handle asynchronous code. Um, do you, how do you handle asynchronous code? Do you guys have to, have to handle asynchronous code? Actually, I'm also using the same, but I do not understand the real, what's the logic behind it? Maybe Hongtad can explain. Well, it's very, it's, I find it kind of hard to explain too. And I, and I bought a book on it and, and I'm reading it and I still have a little bit of trouble, but basically what it's saying when you have an async method is that this method is going to call or do some kind of processing that is going to take some time. And we don't want to block our, um, we don't want to block our um, user, user interface. Uh, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> You don't want to block your user, your interface thread. You don't want to block that thread. So you, this just tells you that you may have to wait on this particular method. Now in an API, everything is considered async because whenever you get employees or most things are, because anytime you get information from a database, you're going to consider that it may take time. And so that's why this is a async method. This is going to take time. Whenever you have an async method, you always return a task. Um, that's just the rules of it. So whatever you're going to return, if I was going to normally return an action result with this list of employees, I would just put the task around it if it's an async method. That's just the rule. And then if I have an async method, it means that I'm calling something in my method that use it, that is going to need to be awaited. And so that's why this await. If this await was not here, um, it's probably going to give me an error. Well, first of all, it's going to give me an error here because this is an async method and it needs to be awaited. But... Mm -hmm. Uh, um, so basically, uh, John, uh, okay, uh, so as you said, like, uh, for async, uh, what I understood is, uh, like, if you are, if we are having a set of uh, applications or synchronous applications, if I will say, uh, which are, which we are basically can say interrelated, uh, then the entire application will get blocked, uh, if anyone, if any of the related application stops responding or uh, something like that, uh, that basically hampers the whole application. And just to avoid this particular thing, uh, we are using asynchronous programming or basically right. the async keyword. Right, and I, I mean, the reason that I'm using async here in a way, I did not think of this myself. Like I told you in the beginning, I watched Pluralsight website and this guy, you know, this is the way he did it. And so I trust because I trust Pluralsight because it's a good website. 
Um, I, and I know this guy knows what he's doing. I trust that this is the correct way to do this. But as far as um, understanding exactly what it does, I know it works. It's kind of one of those magical things that you need to do. <laughs> and I'm not very good at explaining it, but that was right, Hung Tat. That was, that's correct. Um, and I think it's easier to understand in a different context. This is the context of an API. So everything is going to be async because we're dealing with database. And so I can't really show you here where you would use async sometimes and not use it other times that it's a little less, you know, a little hard for me to explain it in this context. Um, yeah. So typically when you, call a database it will take a longer time to return compared to when you're not dealing with the database right. um, so that's why it's recommended to have uh, a wait and a sync right. and you're all right that uh, having a sync means it doesn't block the ui thread right. and for example when you have um, a multiprocessor then you can have many tasks uh, running at the same time you don't have to you, you can continue to process other tasks that are not um depending on each other right, uh, right. so yeah that so you can have multiple tasks at the same time uh, doing its work right so similarly like in your code let's say if you are having two methods and both are not dependent on each other like let's say method one and two uh, you are having like let's say get employees and set employees mm -hmm. uh, so get employee will wait uh, in case of synchronous get employee will wait till the second one gets complete or gets executed yeah that's right yeah so typically right. what you don't need to wait is the ui thread because you want to give the ui some feedback you want to give the user a feedback that uh, actually you are still doing something um, rather than like a kind of like a hang screen right, right you don't want right, a hang right. screen because right. a hang screen means the ui thread is waiting for your database to complete and your data to be sent back to the client so if you do the async and await means you can come back to the ui and say actually we're still waiting but you know you can continue to show a turning spinning wheel right um, or a and, progress and, bar. Right, and it's, it's, it's not, like I said, it's not really, this is not really a good context to show that because an API is not, does not have a GUI per se, but, um, but I think it's important to do it in this context because you are interacting with clients and so it's important that you're able to process things asyn asynchronously. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important for the API, but I, I, you're not going to have directly in this application, you're not going to have the GUI that's going to get held up. Yeah, I can give better examples. Um, asynchronous tasks are mostly, of course, with the database related tasks when you are reading or writing. Or sometimes when we want something to process into another queue, like I want to perform a service which is normalizing my address, or there is a service which is going to uh, there is some integration with a third party, like in your Pizza something, you did a payment gateway implementation. So until the time the payment gateway is working at the background, other things can work. So this kind of tasks are generally asynchronous tasks. Am I right? Right. Well, so for example, this is my WPF application that um, accesses my, um, accesses my API. And this is, so in this application, for example, I do have GUI. And so in my main window, I'm going to, for example, let's see if I can find an example here. Uh, I have so much stuff in here. Oh, that's a cash drawer. I don't want to do that. Okay, so for example, here, if they want to print a kitchen note, they're going to press a button that says print a kitchen note. They want to send something to the kitchen. And in order to do that, they have to send it to the API. So this is an async method. It, pro it should be called async. I try to remember to do that, but sometimes I don't. But here, 
they're going to await and my printing logic is going to print this kitchen note. Well, what this does is this is going to go to the API and print this kitchen note, but that's going to take a little bit of time, not a lot of time, but a little bit. I mean, you know, it's pretty quick, but I need to make sure I'm having a wait here so that it doesn't, when they click that on, when they click that button, it doesn't, uh, freeze up the, the WPF application. So basically that's, like just to, so basically like just to let system wait and not uh, means like uh, abruptly respond or something. We are using this await keyword. Right. The await keyword basically says go off and do this task and continue process. It, what it does is it comes to the, when it comes to this method and it sees that it's async, it says, go ahead and do what's in this, in this uh, method, but don't, don't wait for it. And while you're waiting for it, don't um, block the UI thread. Let the UI thread continue to process and do whatever you want to do. So it basically just lets it go and do its thing and waits for it. And that's, but it waits for it in the sense that it doesn't, it allows the UI thread to continue to do what it's doing. If uh, that makes maybe sense. Maybe I can. Yeah, I think I can give another example. Okay. Yeah, if without as a sync and await, we need to write another. There, there are a few ways to do it. Um, last time, we used to create a new thread um manually, in order to solve the UI thread and um the other thread um processing. So this is one way. The uh, another way will be the um background worker. Yeah, this is this is how we do it last time until we have this a sing and a wait. Right. Yes, I get it. Uh, right. I got one more question. How is it different from multi-threading, or is it similar to multi-threading? I think it is multi-threading, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, That's what this can, is. We can see. We can see. Yes. Okay. I mean the the the. The operating system is responsible for figuring out which thread it wants to use. I mean, that's the beauty of all of this is that um, the CLR or whatever figures out, okay, I want to use a background thread here. I'm going to use, but it can use whatever threads it wants I, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. it, it takes care of that. It takes care of the threading for you, but it definitely is. a. It, so it becomes a multi-threading. Whenever you have async and await, it becomes a, it automatically becomes a multi-threading situation. Uh, I understand. So, I John, uh, one question. Uh, yes. Like, uh, how many methods uh, basically in .NET Core uh, we have, uh, which basically uses this async uh, feature or the keyword? Means which methods? Uh, with which you mean in my API? Different? You mean in uh, my API? Uh, you can take uh, your API, or basically, like I'm, I'm like asking uh, under this .NET code, like how many uh, things we can use, how many methods we have uh, where which we can use on this async keyword. Well, you only, like, you, uh, you use it whenever you need it, but like there's like uh, Like we have HTTP client. Uh, I think somewhere I saw in your application, uh, uh, there was something called HTTP client where you are using that async keyword. Uh, then, you can, uh, uh, Dhananjay, you can use anywhere async. Generally, the purpose of where async is used and not used is where you think there could be an action. Let's say my function is calling another method in the same page. I may not need and it's performing some particular calculation task. I may not need to use async there, but uh, I have something which is hitting some other third service or it, like in this case, her uh, uh, window application her WPF application was calling the web API that time that because it goes through a request and response it can take some time or whenever you are reading something from database at those times we can use asynchronous so there is no fix something that where you can use and not use but generally asynchronous is used where there is a server trip and it's gonna it may take some time so well, uh so can we say like uh, if we have a couple of methods or let's say if we have a set of methods which are basically interrelated uh, like uh, 
uh, we have some database calls in it or which basically uh, uh, like uh, bringing a large amount of data uh, on the UI yeah. side. So on that case, basically, uh, we should say it is a good practice to use async keyword with them. Yes, we would use async for that method that that call is in and we would use await before calling that method. Um, and that method that, that does all of that work should be an async method itself. And so, yes, I mean, I end up because most of the things that I do in my applications in both my Xamarin application, uh, my mobile application and my WPF application, almost everything I do is going out to the database, going to the API and getting data. So I have almost, a, you know, quite a lot of my methods are async. Um, but there are a some times when you don't need it, but it's, it's when you're, when you're going to get data a lot, then obviously you're going to be using it a lot. Um, a time yes, when you, you have the data, but you, you are just processing the data. There could be some functions where you are, you already have the data, but we're just processing it. There you right. don't need it. Right. So for example, I'll show you. So I have some shared business logic here where I have just some very simple helper methods. And so these helper methods are static methods and I'm just getting some, just do, getting some basic, this is getting a full name and concatenating first last name. And so these methods, and this is just really small, but you could have a very large method that's not async because it doesn't do anything. It just does some processing. And so there are quite a few methods in here that are not async, but I just, you know, it's hard to find them because I have so much that is async, you know? <laughs> So, and you also tend not to use async if your result depends on it. So for example, if you want to concatenate the name and return it to the user, you don't want to return the half string that is not concatenated. Right. So yeah, only if uh, it's independent. Yeah. Uh, I like uh, what I understood now is uh, regarding that await keyword, uh, mm -hmm. Like, if we are not using await keyword uh, with such methods, uh, then the method works as a synchronous method. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's yes. right. So, uh, in that case, basically, uh, uh, if it is working as a synchronous method, like uh, then in the case of compiler, uh, will there be any errors or warnings uh, what it should show uh, in case of false or something? Well, like I said, I can't, I have to do an await here. If I don't do an await here, then this return won't work right. I mean, you can't just, you have to use await with asynchronous methods or you have to do some form of await. There's other things you can do and I'm not familiar with them because you're like, you can, you can do like get, you can do a, a extension on here where you, where you can actually wait or configure the await or whatever. I don't use that because they warn, everything I've read warns to be, you have to be very careful and know what you're doing. When you, when you use the async and await, it's very simple and clean and everything works right. But if you're gonna do some of the other, use some of the other methods, you need to know exactly what you're doing. So I'm not, I don't usually use much of anything else. Um, and that might be a topic that somebody can, can, that might be a whole, that's a whole, to async await is a whole topic into itself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because like what, because like what I know, because like I have studied somewhere and, uh, what I know is, uh, we show, we can only show the warning messages over there. And, uh, because in case of synchronous thing, uh, we can only show warnings and, uh, we can't show errors in this case. Right. Well, I don't, I, I mean, I know it will give you warnings and errors if you don't do it right. That's for sure. Um, okay. Because when I first started using async and await, I couldn't figure out how to do it because I kept getting warnings and errors. But I finally figured it out. Like if you don't put this async here, it will not work. They will not like it. See how it does everything? <laughs> it's yeah. like, no, no, we can't do that. I mean, you know, you have to do it forces you to do it the correct way, pretty much. Um, but once you use it, it's very easy to use. And I, I mean, 
it works. I can tell you that it works in production. So, <laughs> um, so any more on that before I go on and try to cover a couple more things or? Yes, you can continue. Okay, so what I was talking about before was these return codes. And what's really nice about NetCore is instead of having to return this status code 200, you just return OK. And then you can pass in your, in this OK method, you can pass your return information. So like here, I passed back my employees. And so it makes it very simple because you can, you can return no content and no content is returned. I'll show you that's a status code 204. No content is returned when you do a, an, a put. So like I have a lot of different methods here, but here I have a put and a put is a, just an update. So typically if you update, um, um, a database record you don't return anything um, and so in this case I return no content and I don't even have you don't know, have anything there so but you can also return here I'm returning a not found because this employee that they're trying to update I don't find that employee so I'm returning a not found so it just makes it a little easier. This is just a short, you know, like a shortcut. You don't, it just makes it very simple. Um, the way NetCore has it set up for you to be able to do these return codes. Um, and there's a lot of different ones. These are the main ones that you would use. You can also use bad request. Bad request means that the, the record, the, um, like let's say they were sending you a, a like an employee to add a new employee and something was not right with that record it wasn't um formatted correctly or there was a null value where there shouldn't be a null value or something then you, you can if you find it you can return a bad request saying that that record was um something was wrong with it uh so the other thing that I, so here um, I have lots of different gets and what I do is each of these, I name whatever I want to name it. So like this is get active employees, but this get active employees, get employees, these are not you, it doesn't really matter what I name them because the way that they're routed depends on the combination of this route here and whatever is here. So in this case, this case, it's this is the route that you use to get here. If you use a get and you use this, then that's how you will get here. And then, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you this in a minute. I'm gonna actually run this in a second. But here, if you want to use this, you would run, it would be the employees, and then you're gonna add this active onto it. And so I have it set up so that if you call this with a get request, it's going to be routed here and get active employees. Um, so you, these all have to be unique. In other words, I can't have two gets with nothing here, or I can't have two gets that have the same information here. These all have to be unique. Now I can have a post that's the same. So like down here, I have a post and it's just a post and it's the same, you know, prefix here, but this is an adding an employee and it's okay that it's exactly the same because it's a post method and not a get method. And this is basic, this is a uh, very standard. When you do a post, you call it and then you um, pass in your created, um, employee and this DTO this means data transfer object and I use data transfer objects to pass back and forth uh, between my clients and my API and that's another thing that I wanted to show you let me go ahead first and just run this so you can see what happens now normally when I run this I wouldn't get um, any kind of GUI but because I have this set up with Swagger, and I don't, I'm gonna show you that, um, it's actually going to produce a user interface.
So have any of you ever heard of Swagger? Are you familiar with it at all? Yeah, I've heard of it, but I uh, haven't really used it myself. Well, yeah, what it is, I is this, this whole thing that you see here, I did not write. This is a, this is a third party plugin, basically a third party library. And it's very widely used when you cr create an API. And so, for example, I'll show you over here. So let's see, I think it's here. So as you can see, here's some ASP.NET Core documentation, and it specifically talks about Swagger. And so it's very commonly used. And it, it, what it really does, what I love about it, is that it automatically documents everything in your API. So for example, this knows that I have an employee controller, and so it's created this employee here. And it's, it's automatically extracted all of the methods that I have. And it's also, whether it's get or post, and it's also showing you how to call this, these items. So for example, I know I'm going to look at this get employees with an ID and this get request will get one employee with this, I, whatever the ID I pass. So, let's say and this will actually let you try this so like if i say try it out i know the version is it, the uh version is one because i just that just happens to be something i need to tell it because i have the versioning but i happen to know that my id for my employee id for for um for the restaurant is nine so if i execute this what it will do is it will return me a 200 status code, which is an okay status code. It shows me here what it called and it's calling local host. It's calling Satchel's API version one employee slash nine. And then it's showing me that is returned to me this employee and it's, it has a pin and it has my name and all this other kind of stuff. And it's also giving response header. Down here, it says the possible types I can get. I can get a 200 response code. I can get a 404 not found response code. So it's giving me that information. So then, and let me show you. So if I wanted, if I just ran this in my browser, you can see that I'm still going to get the employee in the same way. But what Swagger does for me is it just gives me a structure to my, um, my API. And I, you can go in here and you can use it to test uh, what's going on. So like, let me, let me run this again and show you how it, how it works here, just in case you wanna see that. So here I have my employee controller and I'm gonna do my, here we go. This is my get employee, and this is the one that I just called. So if I go over here to my, uh, and run this again, I'm gonna execute it again. I'll go right here to get employee. And see these status okay, status not found? That's what Swagger is using to tell me what my return codes are gonna be. And so then I can walk through here I will get my employee, there's my employee record, and I'm gonna return it, and then it'll come back right here, and I can see the returned record. Now, um, why it's taking so long? It looks like it's still loading. Maybe I'm not, maybe I didn't finish, wait a minute. Maybe I didn't finish doing it. No. Well, it's, it looks like it's held up for some reason. Clear, cancel. Okay, <laughs> it's hung up for some reason. Let me see. Anyway, the, this is a, I, I, the way, oh, I know what I was gonna show you. So let me show you how I implemented Swagger. I don't know why it's hung up. There it goes. 
So the way I implemented Swagger, it's very easy to do. All you do is you go into your startup class and you, you, you could find this code online. It's not hard to do, but in your um, configure services method in your startup class, um, you have a add swagger section and this is where, see where it says Satchel's API for title, that's what this is, Satchel's API and see where it says use for accessing data for Satchel's pizza, that's what this is, I have a version number, so you put that in there and then in your configure method I also have a swagger section and so you just get this code basically and plug it in and it creates the swagger uh interface for you which is really nice okay so one other thing that i wanted to show you was um this employee result filter and we don't really have much time i was gonna um uh, but let me go ahead and just try to talk about it real briefly. I was also going to show you Postman, which is another way that you can test your API. But this is, let me just show you this, this part real quick. So um, here, this employee is my entity that I use for my database. And typically, um, it's not a good idea, not a normal practice for you to return your entity in the same format that you have it in your database. Typically, you want to return, what I do is I return a data transfer object, which is a, it's a different, um, it's just another class and the, the, the data, the reason, the whole uh, thought process behind this is that whatever you have in your database, you may want to provide the client with more or less information. And so you want to have the option to format it differently. So I have what's called, I have a separate project that's called uh, my API DTOs and in it, what did I do? Here it is. In my DTO project, I have three types of DTOs. I have a create DTO, an update DTO, and a return DTO. And they're, they all correspond. So like here I have an employee DTO, that's a return DTO. And then I have an employee create DTO. And then I also have uh, an employee update DTO. And in this case, they're probably very similar, but some, they won't always be. But in this, so here's my employee DTO that I'm gonna return. And in this case, it's probably very similar to my employee. Here, this is my employee uh, uh, entity that I have that corresponds to my database. They're different in that here I'm, I'm indicating that this is, has a key to it. I'm indicating that this, this is a required field and that the maximum length is 50. This maximum length, I'm giving some information, but when I return this employee DTO, I'm just returning data. I don't need all of that, all those attributes. So when here, I'm getting an employee from the database, but I'm returning, I need to return this employee DTO. And so here, this is, this is my database employee. So it looks like I'm returning my data database employee directly. And I, the reason that it looks like that is because I have a filter on here. And what this filter does is it automatically for me reformats this employee into an employee DTO automatically for me. It does that, I'll show you. So I have these filters set up in here and I have a filter for every for all of my uh, all of my record all of my um, the types of data that I have all the diff different classes and so here I have employees where is it employees result filter attribute and this this uh, uh, code I just copied I mean this is just you know, standard code. This is what one of the things that people do. And I just copied it from um, whoever taught me this class, but, or the Kevin guy. But um, what it basically does is it takes that employee and it's going to use Auto Mapper to convert it into an employee DTO. And what Auto Mapper does is it just maps. So all of these, here's my employee. It will map my employee ID 
to my employee ID and it will map my pin to my pin. And it, it, as long as the names are the same, it will just move them over and it just, and, and, you know, in some cases, you would have different information in this DTO. And so if it didn't have all the same information, it would skip whatever was the same. And you can, you can tell it, I mean, Automapper is also a whole different thing. And for Automapper, you have to have profiles that tell you how to map. So like here, I've created a map from my employee to my employee DTO so that it knows how to do that. But I, I don't really have time to go into all that, but really what I wanted to show you, um, because, you know, for lack of time, is that in all of these cases, I'm just returning the data here and I have an, a filter set up to automatically convert it to the type of record that I want to return to my um, clients. And that's just an extra little trick that you can do if you wanted to you didn't, you wouldn't have to do that. You could actually take this out and you could actually map this employ, all these employee records to these employee DTO records yourself. This is just a shortcut that um, is available in .NET Core. It probably is available in just not .NET Framework as well, but I, um, I haven't used, I haven't done an API in the framework. I've just done it in .NET Core. So I don't know what's available, you know, with that. But um, since I'm out of time, do you guys have any questions about anything? Hi. Hi, hello. Hi, Joanne. Uh, I have actually one question. Hello. Okay. Hello. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, I would like to know that uh, if the cases like uh, in one API controller, I want to call different handler. How will it, uh, uh, because I don't want to rewrite the same piece of code if there is already another, uh, another controller already handled on it. So can I do something like call in the, in the one controller API? I call another uh, handler, call like multiple handler in the same controller. So you're saying, can I call one method from one method in the controller to another method in the controller? Yes. Like so, for example, yeah. Well, what I do is if I have uh, common um, methods that I need in more than one controller, I put them in a separate um, uh, library that I inject, or I could put it as a private, I could also put it as a private um, method here. I can still put a private method here that does logic that I want to do that's common between more than one. But I don't, okay. you don't generally call, like I don't generally call uh, another, I don't, I, I don't, you don't generally call one method from another method directly in your controller. All of these controllers uh, are routed from the client. But one thing I did want to mention is you can, there are these, these items here, and I didn't really show you, but here, this comes from a query. So uh, they can, they can format a query. Um, with a string name and it will give more information. So sometimes you're, what I'm trying to say is sometimes, um, like in this case, if they did a query that was active only equals true, then it would change the meaning of this method. So this method can be used in several different ways. Um, it, with or without okay. a query is what I'm saying. So where you do a uh, if else to call different methods or there is some other ways of doing it? So you're saying if I want to call, if I want to call other methods um, from like these example, methods? Yeah, I, uh, I have these general names like get employee by names. But in the in the request itself, right? I have a type 
like for this type is being handled this way but for another type i will be handled in another way so but basically it returns the same response but right. maybe there is some condition is different i need to like uh handle different way on the condition so if i may if i may doreen in your case yes you can call actually what depends upon you can have a general get employed by type and then if you get employed by type depending upon the type value you can internally call three more functions get employees by name get employees by department get employees by xyz right what happens is you see every function here has something called http get and other thing so which define that what kind of result it will be uh, getting some uh, in your some methods would be which are resulting json result some would be actual resulting returning your view so maybe an action result so it depends upon what type of your method is in your condition of course yes you can do this that you create three different functions which returns let's say json result and uh, in your actual function which is going to be calling those internally three function it stores that json result into another variable and finally that is passing the value to your javascript or to your view so yes you can make the code customized in this way there's lots of ways that you can okay. set these up and i don't know if this the way i did this here get employee by name contains and then has a query is is conventional I mean, since I'm only using this internally with my own clients, I can pretty much do whatever I want. But you get the idea that you can pretty much set it up however yeah. you want to set it up. Yeah, there is many different ways. So I, I just, uh, because I'm quite new in this, uh, I'm not sure which one is the most efficient one of doing it. Yeah. Well, my, my, my policy is if it works, then I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I understand what you mean about it being efficient. Um, one thing that's really great about .NET Core is it is really fast. And I'm finding that in production in this restaurant, and this restaurant's a little restaurant, so I mean, it's not going to have a lot of traffic, but for my purposes, it works really well. <laughs> so, uh, it, are we done or? <laughs> I think uh, we're good. <laughs> I, one I, last I, question. Okay. Can, can I? Because sure. uh, I, I'm. I'm spending some time to finding the profile for Swagger. But uh, do, do you have any ways or recommended ways of doing profiling on Swagger? Um, any ways of doing what with Swagger? Profiling. Mean, uh, profiling. Well, I, what I would do if I were you is do some Google do some Google uh, searches on Swagger because there's there should be a lot of information online about how to integrate if that's what you're talking about integrating Swagger into your API. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by compiling. You uh, mean profiling. integrating? She she's actually referring to profiling. Are you saying oh, yes. you want to test the speed of your API? Uh, uh, the oh, okay. query, the query of the yeah EF. Yeah, I don't. Um, I um. I think there's a tool you can turn it on in Visual Studio. Um, right. If you have it, if you, I know there's more. I know there's a lot more profiling available if you have a higher, you know, a, a paid version. But there may oh. be profiling you can do on this too. Uh, there, there is. Um, this is not a paid version. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. There, there is. Uh, if you're yeah, using it, a paid, yeah, paid version, oh. you can. Uh, it will turn on by default, and you get a panel where you show all the information there, like the key, uh, query performance, your API performance, and what are the code that you have run, and they'll show you the time as well, the response time, and 
Yes, I did. That is that the enterprise version that you're talking about? Yeah, I believe so. I think enterprise? professional version. You 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 can get it already. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, I will check that out because I try to use the uh uh mini profiler that um, I I not managed to <laughs> because it needs to customize the Schrager UI that uh somehow I not managed to get it. There may be some third party third party tools out there that you could use as well. I don't know um, okay. to do because because I know that enterprise version is very expensive. Um, I used to have the professional version and it was um, to have the professional version is um, over a thousand dollars, I think, for the first year and then $800 a year after that. And then enterprise is even more expensive than that. So um, but I think that you might be able to find some free tools out there uh, because there's always people like us that don't want to pay all that money to Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no comment on that. <laughs> well, and I shouldn't say we don't want to pay the money to Microsoft. We don't, we can't afford to pay that money to Microsoft. Yeah, that's yeah. more appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that kind of money laying around to pay to Microsoft. <laughs> we have other good uses of that money. <laughs> yeah. By the way, thank you so much for the very good advice from the team. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Let me Joanne. see if I can uh, stop sharing. I was going to try to get my face back up here. Um, I don't know what's that. Just All right, I'm gonna... at the bottom. Just hold at the bottom and you will see the video icon. Yeah, I I I stop recording now. <laughs>